Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rowan Williams. I'm a theologian and a writer, and I used to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm very delighted to welcome you all to today's special RSA online event. Thanks very much for joining us. And I'm delighted today to have the chance to speak to Professor Lucy Easthope. Lucy is a world authority on recovery from disaster. She's advised on the response to pretty well every major disaster of the past two decades, from 9-11 to 7-7, the tsunami, and more recently, the COVID pandemic. She's professor in the practice of risk and hazard at the University of Durham, and also a fellow at the University of Bath in their Center for Death and Society. But most importantly for this afternoon, Lucy is the author of a really wonderful book, When the Dust Settles, which will be the starting point for our discussion today. This book sets out with great detail, great sensitivity, some of the experience that Lucy has been through in her reactions to and involvement in disaster recovery in the last decades. And it's a story interwoven with her own experience of trial, suffering and crisis in her own life. It's a book which shares a great deal with generosity and humanity which invites us to think about the lessons we learn from the very worst moments of individual and collective experience. The experiences we remember from the news headlines of recent years, but also experiences which all of us will have in our lives in one way or another. It shows us some of the unseen elements of the fallout from disaster. It shows us something of the horror, the hope, the positivity, the human dimension the small details that make up the large picture. I'm greatly looking forward to discussing this remarkable book with Lucy, and I'm very glad that she's given the time for this. If those of you watching along would like to join the conversation about the event on Twitter, you're more than welcome to do so using the hashtag RSA Disaster Response. All the details can be found here in the YouTube chat. Lucy, delighted that you're joining us. It's a great pleasure and a great privilege to be talking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me just start the ball rolling by asking what I think is, is a fairly basic question arising out of the book. One of the things you come back to again and again in the book is the importance of physical things, treating physical remains with dignity and attention, but also recognising that small things, small physical things matter to people as as I almost tend to say relics of those that they love. And I wonder if you could say why you think it matters to deal with, with the dead with dignity. Is it something to do with the fact that if we treat the dead with dignity, we learn better to treat the living with dignity as well? Absolutely. And, and thank you so much for that question. I think relics absolutely is the word, actually. And, and, and relics was somewhere that I had found myself drawn to to help me make sense of the power that these small items had had. I would often find um, a, a great level of understanding in uh, theological texts or in a cathedral or, you know, the, the, the idea of being able to lay hands on something. I think I'd also grown increasingly concerned about the idea Almost, almost in the same way as people were seeking a thrill from, say, watching a, a horror film, the idea that the dying or the dead or the personal effects of the dead or the body of the dead should offend us. And that had become a huge part. Um, and perhaps it was really only when I started to write how protected I felt because what I'd noticed with families in disaster or, 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 or um, the, the, the survivors and the bereaved that we were dealing with was as well as all of the other many pains that they were having to face, they were also have to justify, having to justify their need. So the wonderful Pam Dix, who lost her brother in Lockerbie, uses the phrase that she was described as a ghoulish sightseer for wanting to go to the place where he had died. And that has always stayed with me, that it is not for us to judge or, or to censor. And I often found uh, great comfort, actually, that the, the religious world seemed much more comfortable than that with that than the secular world. It's very interesting that 
you describe this in terms of how we project onto other people something of our own fear or our own disgust sometimes. And getting beyond that, it seems to me, is, is absolutely fundamental in the work that you do. You, what you've just described made me think of a, a really very harrowing book I read a few years ago by somebody I know slightly, whose sister had been one of Fred West's murder victims. Yes, yes. She describes in that book when her sister's remains were finally discovered and how she sat with those remains, just sitting with them on her lap. And yes, it's, it's a shock. It's, it's hard to come to terms with that. And yet the last thing you want to do is to say, well, that kind of connection, that kind of reaction is, is invalid. Absolutely. And I'm both familiar with the book and also we'd had a, a presentation at the Centre for Death and Society at Bath um, by, by that relative. And it had also been something that um, I, I briefly mentioned in the book, my, um, my understanding and, and work experience with the older Hay scandal, where, um, where uh, ch children's, particularly uh, paediatric remains, were discovered in uh, re repositories in hospital. And I'd encountered something similar. And, you know, a book, all books have to be edited. And in fact, that chapter, as with all the chapters, could have been much longer. And actually with several of the mothers that I encountered there, when they received notification that um, sometimes it was what we call cell blocks. So it's literally just pathology samples on, on blocks um, uh, to preserve them. They would ask to sit with them. And I was very proud that we'd reached a point in our understanding of families' needs that, that families, wherever possible, were allowed to do that. And I, I knew of several uh, family members who, who sat with their remains. And, and that, was, uh, that was one of the huge things. You never know when you, when you put a book out how it will be received. The last thing I wanted was people to, to feel revulsion because that would have invalidated my experience but also families experiences of, of of it was the antithesis of revulsion it was it was peace and the center for death and society at bath had been around i think for about 20 years now and and um for many years that's been the place that i've been going to often with a huge um theological steer to make sense of new trends and how to facilitate. So long before the pandemic, actually, they had started to explore, is a Zoom funeral the way forward? So they were always ahead of the curve. And you'd have, you know, three or four days every, every two years of conferences where people would come and explain how to facilitate these, these connections. Because obviously to view something like a, like, a, like a slide block is very different than to sit with a coffin. So, so I, you know, one of the things that is very important to me is to constantly see and learn how this is being facilitated for families. I know this is taking us a little bit away from the main subject of the book, but I think it is, it is connected. There have been a couple of books recently in the last four or five years about the, the industrializing of death, you know, the way in which the funeral business is really buying into a sort of mass destruction almost that, that the the intense technologizing of this does take us away from strangely from the the physicality of being with the dead and the dying um i've had some experience and i'm sure you have as well of woodland burials and that yeah. kind of thing, people rediscovering almost by the back door the possibility of of a less distanced a less industrialized a less professionalized approach to death do you think this is a broadly speaking, a, a good, a constructive development a, away from that highly technological approach. Yes, and I also think it will, will be, be, become even more necessary. You know, very sadly, um, you know, the way the world may go over the next few years, you know, the, the later diagnosis of treatment, the longer wait for an ambulance, more people, I think, will encounter both dying and also death, you know, and... and we're seeing after the pandemic, of course, it doesn't hit equally. You know, it doesn't take one person from one street. It might take three members of a family. We're seeing people almost schooling themselves on their options and wanting to get back to, you know, to, to more simplistic ways. And possibly also, you know, things like we've seen a, an increase in, in direct cremation. So getting away from the expense 
and perhaps honoring the person in a different way. Some really big questions about the meaning of the body. And I actually, I remember very early on chatting with a, with a very important friend of mine who, who specializes in the technology of, of death saying, you know, this will be one of the biggest moments of innovation that we will see. And I think we're just at the start of it. And what, you know, you can tell, I hope to do with the book is provoke, provoke some discussions about what that, that looks like. And I think the first thing to do is to remove the fear because actually an entire industry has developed to take away, you know, you don't have to look, you don't have to see. Um, and there are other nations, as you well know, kind of staring in on us going, why have you lost your connection to your forebears and your elders? Why are you afraid of this body? Um, and so I, I'm very interested in, in, in those aspects of where that discussion will go. If you were trying to think of how, how you might introduce children and young people to this, to prepare them for that experience, where would you start? Well, uh, would that be to disaster generally or to... Uh, to particularly to, mortality. I yeah, mean. I mean, it's very, very interesting. And I, again, I'm a, I'm a constant, you know, constant scholar. Well, not even a scholar, I'm a pupil. You know, I'm constantly interested in, and, uh, you know, learning. And often, of course, other, other countries are much better at teaching us how this is done. And uh, I have a lot of uh, Irish Catholic friends where children, for example, will attend the, 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 the wake and, and the open coffin much earlier than, you know, uh, m myself might have seen a, might have seen a body. Um, and so I'm always very interested in, uh, in how other uh, cultures and religions talk about death around, around children. I think it's probably quite a westernized luxury that our children don't have the intimacy or, or hopefully don't always there was um there was a piece in the book that didn't make the final cut it's <laughs> a so 520,000 words down to 78,000 and I think one of the reasons it didn't make the cut was be is because you know there were such important things to discuss around humanity and people and disaster that to give an example that perhaps sounded very uh, perhaps trivial but when when my my eldest daughter was four our dog was run over outside the house on bonfire night and she asked to see it and I remember this sort of look of utter horror on my husband's face and I went to look at it first and it was it had some injuries but it, it wasn't badly injured it had been a you know very clean blow and I put it in a box and she sat with with the dog and said you know the dog was was, was had passed but she sat with the dog and said goodbye and she had a whole narrative around that and you know that was you know it is a, it is a small example but obviously it's something that you you think about a lot with them being able to 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 come to come full circle with a life both of my children grow up around a lot of animals and there's always been that discussion you know in farming and agricultural communities of of of, of the cycle of life so I think it's very 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 important I think we've really challenged um, what we were promising our children when the pandemic happened. You know, <laughs> all kinds of sort of weird social contracts. You know, there's eternal life. If you eat well, you can get to 110. You know, all these things we'd promised them that they had um, they had totally absorbed. That if you were good, life was fair that if you were, you know, if you were well behaved, you got to go to your prom. And so I think one of the things, it's not just about mortality, it is about, um, it is about uh, reality as well. And the pandemic, I remember very early on in, in give, giving some government presentations, the obvious thing that, that the people were afraid of was how to tell people the truth. And I think that's true of whether you're five or 55, you know, that, that how to sit with a child and say, dad's not going to get any better and um you know we've been very lucky in our family that we haven't had to have too many big discussions with our with our children but of course one of the themes in the book has been how our lives have changed and the children have been very much part of those discussions there are also times generally i'm always very frank i think with children and i'm often give i'm often asked by say head teachers after disaster how to talk about this where i was slightly where I perhaps slightly was was slightly editing myself was probably on more recent events with things like Ukraine, where the children said, you know, are we safe? My children and, and also children that I was working with in, in the charities that I'm involved in. And on that, I sort of broke my own rule. And I just said, 
we're, you know, we're doing everything you we can, don't worry about it. You just do your maths lesson. Whereas normally I think we've got into this big, you know, trope of having these very honest discussions. I could see that after the pandemic, many children were just completely overwhelmed. So I slightly broke my own rule there. And I was just like, you know, the adults have got this, you just play. Yes, and I, I think that's that's a very humane response. It's a bit of a tightrope, isn't it? Because you, you want to say, okay, you don't lie to your children about the kind of world this is because it's no service to them. Yeah. And I think you nail it very well in talking about the implicit contract that we sell yeah. people. It's all, all going to be fine if you eat your greens. Yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah. that, that's not quite it. At the same time, you want to say, you're not out there on your own. Yes. Yes. And in certain moments of real crisis, you, you need to say that yeah. to a child or any vulnerable person. Yes. Um, you're not just left to it. OK, yeah, this is difficult, but don't, don't panic. Yeah. Um, don't, don't think you're alone. Often the most important thing we can say to anybody, isn't it? And yeah. I, I yeah. took again from your book so much of that simple accompaniment and listening and taking seriously the emotional register that people we're living in and responding accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. But we've, we've started talking a bit about the pandemic here. And of course, one of the things you say very challengingly in the book is that the um, COVID pandemic was the most diligently planned for risk in British history. Yeah. So not at, not at all a, the left field disaster that nobody was expecting, but in fact, something which we really should, should have understood better in advance. What, what are the things that stop us reacting as, as our intelligence tells us to? I think, um, you know, practically, there are reasons why these become, you know, it's a bit like uh, you know, going to the dentist or tackling climate change. You know, if, if it can wait, you know, the gas bill comes in, but it's, it hasn't gone red yet. If it can wait, we can. And so just very practically, and it would be very interesting to see sort of the evidence base given to the inquiry, but very practically, this, this can got kicked down the road uh, around the pandemic. And also, I think, emergency planning as a whole was under-resourced by the time we we, we, we entered it. I also think, um, and I, I you know, make gently clear in the book, you can't uh, excel in your pandemic response if health and social care are struggling. And so you needed a really robust health uh, and all aspects of that from primary care through to intensive care. And then you needed a really good multi-generational integrated social care system where we completely valued um, older life and it was at the heart of a community. And we, I mean, you know, one of the things that this, this last year has really brought me into contact with is, is, you know, domiciliary care workers and care home workers. And, you know, the idea that a, a 16, 17 year old working in a fast food restaurant can earn more than we were paying the, those people and the terms and the conditions. And, and I've, you know, for, for some work that I've been doing, I've been very up close to some of that. And I, I don't think I'd, I'd fully placed enough emphasis on the relationships. So these are the homes that I've been working in are for learning disabled younger adults. Mm -hmm. I hadn't realized the, the bond that they'd, they'd established with their, their care worker. So, you know, I, before the pandemic, you were thinking our social care isn't isn't up to this. It, it hasn't been resourced, and then it, and then it happened. And really, there were some things that I uh, I really mourn and I'm very angry about weren't put in place January to March 2020. But I also think there were some things that there'd been this slow rot in the years before for social care. And and I actually think that it's not a political fix. It is a societal fix it has to be removed from an electoral cycle it has to be removed from manifestos and it has to be us because the one the one certainty if we do uh, live our lives you know to the point that maybe some of us hope to get to is the one truth is that you will get older and the one truth at the end of that is that you will die <laughs> and yet the amount of denial about what that that looks like and the amount of um you know i don't quite know what the right word is but probably arrogance about uh you know social care is somebody else's problem and one of the things uh, you know and i know that you, you you see this in 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 a spiritual life as well is that when you are either in a geriatric ward um or in 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 care home visiting 
all walks of life are in those beds. And there's no doubt that at 20 or 40, they did not picture themselves needing the help that they needed. So I, although I'm, you know, a, a disaster planner, that's what I'm, I, I do. I end up becoming very passionate about other things that run simultaneously. And one is for us to be able to go into our next pandemic much more robust, there has to be an urgent discussion on our care of our most needed and our, on our eldest. And I think what, what I hear you saying there is that our, our response to extreme situations can't just be reactive. We have, we have to be proactive in, in thinking what, as you say, what kind of structure we want to build around yeah. crises. Yeah. So there are resources already in place. Yeah, yeah. And in, in disaster planning, so I, I'm a disaster uh, recoverer, but with quite a sort of public sector focus. But in the corporate world, it's given, a, you know, some of it's given a different name. It's sort of crisis management and business continuity. And I think one of the reasons that we've just had this terrible global pandemic, but on most days been able to pick up a meal deal, is that our corporations all around us greatly value the purpose of disaster planning because it's not a one-off it's not empty it actually in, in, improves your your business and if we could apply that to communities so the readiness that you would you know saying to get the nhs ready for a flu pandemic would not would not be a waste of resource it would be so that i use that example because a flu pandemic is 2023's highest risk even though it's very hard to sell at the moment but the idea that you would invest in the NHS and its people isn't wasted resource or time. And I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges for me is this this has a, a much greater benefit. And I think you you drew out in that that, you know, in, in your understanding of my book, that this was trying to ask questions for all of us about what next. And that was very important to me. I think so. I, I think that that is. A fundamental one because part of what your book amounts to in my mind is is a bit of a plea for a more intelligent kind of solidarity yeah. understanding that okay there are extreme experiences some people are going through we're only a couple of handshakes away from some of those experiences and we're all of us going to face a certain kind of extremity as we grow old and more fragile and so we'd better start thinking about it not obsessively not anxiously but just seriously and and also thinking together. Thinking that's together, that's not perfect. Together. Yeah, that's the perfect summation. Although, although be, you know, you, your interpretation was beyond anything I could have dreamed of. But yes, exactly that. You know, that was exactly what I was, I was calling for. And I think there was this dance that you, you knew I was dancing between these very large totemic events that had become very, you know, seared in people's minds. But being able to say, you know, suffering at any level. Um, creates a lot of the same same experiences um, and and I think it's not an exhausted plea at all I think there's still energy in me but I also think you get the frustration that um, how much how many times must we have the same conversations about what would the what would our children's future look like I know it's, it's a sort of what on earth would it take question isn't it yes. <laughs> coming back, whether it's whether it's pandemic or climate change or any any more local and specific issues. But you, you've just touched there a little bit on some of the, the personal edge of it for you. And the, one of the phrases that stuck with me is the hardest part is going home. Yeah. And that transition from all that you've had to cope with, all that you've had to know, and then what contains it, what what helps you manage it when you go back to some sort of normality. Yes. And it's that line I'm very proud of. I was at the time, but now more than ever, because so many colleagues and distant colleagues have taken a photograph of it and just sent it to me saying, you got it, you know, you, you summed it up. Because I think this also links back to this idea of the work must horrify us or the work must revolt us or traumatize us. We're, we're, we're you know, we're incredibly proud of our work. And that means that the tribe is, it, you know, the, the, the disaster responders, there's blue light, responders in that there's hospital responders we we're incredibly proud we, we, there's a lot of camaraderie which I think I draw out in the book there's a lot of intimacy so we're not heading off miserable about what we might see but what we haven't really got right over the years 
and it's the same in, in, in fields like the military, professions like the military, it's very difficult to come home and demob from that. And what's been very moving is to have conversations with, with colleagues in the military and the police and forensics over the last few weeks, that this is the first time they've, they've, they've gone and bought a copy of the book for say their partner and sort of pushed it across the table and sort of explained that's why, that's why I'm in my own head, you know, a lot of the time kind of thing. And that's meant an awful lot to me. And I think that's something that requires even greater exploration. I think it's why we see veterans with such high levels of mental illness and not perhaps being able to integrate into society. It's a, something we're all worried about with the healthcare provision at the moment, healthcare providers and, 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 and resources for, for responders. And there's a default position in current UK thinking to make that a mental health issue. So what I've been very clear on is to not be able to bring it home doesn't mean that you are mentally ill and unable to, you know, I use the words unable to form the words on your palate. Sometimes it's right that you can't bring it home. And so looking at the ways that we support and resource workers, you know, we have very high levels of suicide in, in, in emergency response workers and police and teachers and, and asking how do we, not necessarily, you know, the best type of, of psychological provision, which definitely has a place, but how do we create the space to honour? So a lot of what I do at the moment, for example, is talk about, talk to organisations about uh, so with social work as an example, hiring a, a garden or a national trust property, which doesn't necessarily sit well with council finances, but so that the social workers can go and debrief together before they go home. And of course, that was very difficult with with home working. So, you know, not just what treatment is needed, but what space is needed. And then for me personally, that had taken the form and it was a real it was a difficult decision to include this in the book, but I'm very proud that I had, was that work literally never came home. There was two very distinct swim lanes and equally proud and important to me. But, uh, you know, I, as I said, I think recently, the, the first time my husband read the first opening chapter, which is a very graphic arrival at, at a disaster scene, the first time he ever realised that was when he read the proof of the book. I'm glad you use the word space because I think the challenge is very much where do you put it and that can be really as, as basic as physical a yeah. question as, as you've just said hire a space you know make sure that there is somewhere that is nurturing unthreatening yeah. beautiful yeah quiet yes and, and then find the people yeah yeah, yeah. I, I remember when when I was in my old job we used to organize a day every year for forces chaplains yeah. without very much agenda. We just invited them to, to Lambeth Palace for the day and gave them a meal yeah. and mostly left them to talk to each other. Yes. On the yeah. assumption that there were things they could say to each other that nobody else could say. Yes. And that, that needed some space to happen. Absolutely. So, you know, to, ena to enable it to happen in terms of having to brief, you know, senior leadership at a council or whatever, I'll often say, you know, call it an away day or a training day. And then this very general agenda will appear for exactly those reasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things I, I talk about in the book is actually using um, church house for a meeting, which is a very, you know, beautiful, solemn space. But of course, churches and cathedrals, um, you know, and, and often churches have a, a, a multi-use room. And um, what I often find, you know, um, is, is the drawing of, of emergency responders to those spaces. So we were quite rightly, you know, after the Grenfell disaster, which was really, I think, emergency planning, one of its lowest points, the first conference that we had in that, we actually had it in a in a in a church space because we we wanted to be together, but with that with that reflection and and you know I think it creates a a, a vibe where you're not you know often corporate spaces can feel very competitive and there's all the IT and everything. and so for me you know there's been a long history of the importance of the quiet calming space and its role in disaster recovery. Uh, and that, you know, and, and, and also linked to that is the lifescapes, as I call it in the book of recovery. So places that start to mean something um, to a community are often very similar as well. And I think if we have a very 
kind of over functional approach both to space and to time we lose that we we say well you know why why do we want to keep that space open why do we want to give that amount of time yeah. and we we forget that well human beings actually take the space they need and take the time they need yeah and yeah. and we're not good at that on the whole we we want quick results we want snappy correlations between input and output and on the whole we don't really work like that as as persons somehow no and you know one of the things that you see for example in disaster response is sort of the safe the safe family members will be selected for meeting with ministers you know the ones that will stay coherent the ones that won't cry the ones that won't if they cry it be in a very delicate way it won't be a big animal rage or roar and I always think that's very interesting how we sanitize, you know, the interactions, you know, I think I'll write briefly about it with flooding that, you know, that the, the, the residents think they're going to go to a meeting and then they're, they're not, they're sort of disinvited, they don't get their invites. And of course, one of the things that would happen is people would say, I would love to hear about res from residents, or we'd love to hear from a bereaved group, but they'll overrun the timetable, you know, and we've got quite a strict, you know, presentation order today. And, that's always interested me about the, the messiness of trying to hear people's pain and, and, and stories. And, and, and we're struggling with it with the pandemic. You know, we're really struggling with how to honour this. And this sort of, we're, we're neat, you, you use the word before, we're already neatly packaging what this is. And it will look like this. And that, that sort of rage and grief is aberrant. And, and it's, very, it's very important, I think, um, to, just, to, just give, to just give space. And, and I... I also talk in the book, which I think again has come from a lot of schooling in, in theological environments has been about the importance of silence and the importance of listening. And it, it doesn't come easily to me, I'm a chatter. But, you know, watching, watching um, from others, funeral directors and hospital workers and, and ministers, the role of silence in disaster recovery. Um, and not filling it, and that's been very important. Not filling it, yes. It's, um, I think it's the French philosopher Simone Weil who talks about the temptation to fill the void. Yes. We, we always want to stuff something into the, the emptiness because it makes us feel a bit more comfortable for a moment. Yeah. But it doesn't, it doesn't help. Yeah. No. And the callousness, you know, in bereavement, the things that people say, you know, and within minutes, you know, and, and, and so it's not just silence. Sometimes it's also, and I, you know, you don't want people to tie themselves up in knots, but, you know, some of the things that I've seen both in family bereavement, personally, but also in disaster, just these utter clangers. So, you know, kind of informing yourself, I think, about, about being in those spaces. I often think about the worst spaces I've ever had to construct is the family assistance centers of what are called the family and friends re reception centers. And that's a very, that's a very strange ether space because it's not at that point, the families don't have their bad news yet. So it's very specific to disaster or to sudden crime. And so they're waiting to be, you know, they're waiting to be selected and it can literally be like, Oh no, your loved one is fine. You go through that door. You know, you can see all kinds of sort of grotesquely clunky, clumsy treatment of people. And to be trained. And I, you know, I still get it wrong now, but I think if everybody in the world went through that, that training, <laughs> we might be a lot better <laughs> at just, you know, comforting somebody in their hour of need, because that really is an exercise in diplomacy at the worst time of people's lives. And that relates a bit, doesn't it, to one of the, the most distinctive features of the book, which is the way in which you, you weave together your own experience of trauma and, and suffering and the, the broader professional experience you've got. And this is a difficult thing to talk about, I know, and you might not want to, but can you say a little bit about how those have interacted in your experience, how you've learned from one and carried through to another, the experience of personal loss and stress and how that has informed and enlarged your response elsewhere oh absolutely and one thing i was i was very grateful to you in in your response to the book was that you you i think you understood and drew out the importance that i was in the book as well you know because when i was when i was you know chatting to my editors and things there was obviously this fear of hang on you know i can't make this book about me it's not about me and you know very, all the early drafts were sort of very third person this is what happens and um, you know, now I realise that it doesn't work unless you understand a bit more about me, but also that I'm 
I'm learning all the time. So I'm bringing my own experience into it and then, you know, tipping the lens to look at it from another view all of the time. And also, I think that what has been, you know, I'm a month into it being out in the world and what has been lovely is people rallying to the idea of who I am as a person. So right from the start, I think you get this idea that, you know, I'm not a secretary of state or a mayor or a general. I don't have a, I don't have a clearly defined role at various points. I have a relatively clearly defined role. But, I, you know, you get this real sense from the start of the book that this, this woman with her own health and physical struggles is sort of trying to make her way into the right meeting and getting lost and all those kind of things. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm schooled by people who've, who've suffered bereavement after disaster and I'm learning from them. Um, and I'm, you know, all the time, ex you know, experiencing some, some, of their, some of their learning through their eyes, but never, never understanding. And then I, I start to try and have children and I just suffer recurrent pregnancy loss. And it's not, you know, Brit Brit British people, I think, are very obsessed with the hierarchy of grief. And, and I'm not in any way saying this is comparable to this. But what it did allow me to do was experience bad care and good care and compassion and lack of compassion. And, you know, I talk about, you know, the, the camaraderie of women each in a bed on the the gynecological ward you know I might be a young woman who's miscarrying but the woman next to me might be just at the very end of life you know the hospital wards can often be like that so again I'm being schooled by another environment and I think what I'm I'm also experiencing again going back to your first question with the pregnancy losses is the meaning of the the loss you know and I, I think there's much more discussion about that now but it, it is a it is a um, it is a very biological visceral process, and uh, there is a slightly more guidance now. But there had been a lot of of confusion and misunderstanding about what to do when you when you lose a pregnancy and and a, and a fetus. So that was that was a point at which my my feelings about resting remains and treating remains with dignity took on a slightly different uh analysis and i realized it had to be in the book to help me on to help me make sense of where where my own work was going um and also that allowed me to discuss a huge theme in the book which is the meaning of of things that show somebody has been and again you know the relics mm -hmm. that's right we we don't just live in a world of dead stuff i think this is something which <laughs> to my mind comes back in so many ways as, as you think about the world we actually inhabit yeah. um, somebody put it recently in a seminar i was in that um, there's a kind of philosophical approach which just says the world consists of me plus stuff <laughs> and, and that's not how it works we right. we inhabit a world where things are fraught with significance drawn into our relationships they're sort of colored by our relationships yeah. um, and so we can't let go of them just casually because the relationships are bound up with them. And, and that's what it is to live the sort of lives we lead as people who, who are embodied, people who talk to each other, people who tell stories to each other, who remember the past, who imagine the future and, and all those other things which are so basically human. And that, that I guess, is part of what I valued so very much in the book. And when, when you talked about just... Uh, a few minutes ago, talked about the stories and the need to the need to be able to bring stories to some sort of conclusion. I suppose part of the the anguish that a lot of people felt during the pandemic was exactly that isolation, which so many people have commented on. People wanted to be physically close to those they cared about in terms of, of extremity, and and you wrote very eloquently at the end of the book about how we'd been coached in a kind of collective fear which was really mm, getting into our dna in a very unhelpful way yeah yeah and was very it it, it leaves us in a very difficult position to build a recovery to yeah. build the next step it's not impossible uh <laughs> and there's definitely you know i you know i don't think i'd have this biggest smile on my face if i didn't believe there were horizons it it's a very difficult uh position to come to come back from and even you know there's a big debate at the moment about you know working from home and buildings empty and all of these kinds of things 
what we'd learned was if the messages are too strong, it's like a very blunt tourniquet and the limb dies when perhaps the limb was salvageable. There had to be nuance. And I, you know, I keep a good lid on it for, you know, for, <laughs> for sort of personal resilience reasons, but the, the inability to allow people to be with their dying and actually to allow people to be with their dead. And one of the things I became very vocal about as soon as we had a really good picture of the risk, uh, you know, up, right up until last year, we still had funeral directors who were not allowing people to either view or uh, we had situations where people were not being allowed to supply clothes. Um, and, you know, there was there was national guidance that said you could. But of course, all of these things take a long time to percolate down. So I was intervening on behalf of individual families at some point. Because what we had learned for many, many years was one of the hardest things for communities is ambiguous loss. It is, it is to have not had a body or to have tortured yourself with not being there at the end. And what we're not doing enough of at the moment, and I definitely think that's where the discussion has to go rather urgently, is to help people with feelings that they seem to be being allowed to hold very individually so thousands and thousands and thousands of people being told the same thing or feeling the same thing but not being told that that's perfectly normal to feel and the way that I gauge that is if I say something on social media about this is ambiguous loss what you're feeling here. and then I might link to a leaflet that was written by disaster action which is for bereaved families of disaster who may never have had a body back and I get this a huge outpouring there's something wrong with that that we haven't found a way to tell people that feeling is okay and that feeling is expected and even I was quite distressed yesterday by a study that had, that had calculated how many people wouldn't be dead if they had had if they if the vaccine had been invented a year earlier and you and I know that's a rabbit hole that you just don't want to send a bereaved family down. So I think the next year, the, the, the responsibility will be on the lantern bearers, as I call those who lead communities through disaster recovery. The responsibility will be on them to correct some of this, you know, not in a regime way, but in a very therapeutic way that 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 you have to let that go. You can't torture yourself that if the vaccine had been here a year earlier, he would still be here. You can't torture yourself that he was alone. You can't torture yourself like this in the same way as we do with, with, with disaster healing. But the first thing we have to fix, as you say, is what I call this anti-human fear, the, the particularly towards children and young people as vectors of disease. We have to we have to lose that. And where I sometimes find myself slightly in battles is that is in no way me playing down the virus. But, you know, it was one of the things that I'd been very interested in after the major Ebola outbreak in 2014 was how do they deal with the anti-human fear? And, you know, as soon as it was possible, people started to come back together again. And, and, that's one of the things we probably have to think about is weighing up, you know, constant issues of super spreading with the fact that we've we've lost human connection in a very difficult way. That's right. I mean, weighing up, which means discernment, prudence, yeah. or ordinary, what, what I'd call cultural sense, yes. which is not about absolutes yeah. and um, completely risk free environments. I was thinking back, actually, as I read what you wrote about the pandemic, and as, as I heard you this afternoon, thinking back to the early days of the HIV AIDS crisis, and again, the way in which a terror of contamination yes. and distancing and suspicion around physical contact all kind of poured into this rather toxic approach, which I think affected those early years of the HIV AIDS pandemic really quite, quite severely and, and damaged countless people in that way. And if I hear you rightly, you're saying we're, we're a bit in danger of the same kind of panic about contamination. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, as I say in the book, and you know, the book is not a political rant at all, but I, you know, I, I give reasons for why things have happened. And we do have a proliferation of what's called psychological uh, behavioral insight across government. So how will this be received and how will this be felt? 
And one of the things that myself as a disaster recoverer had been asked to do was feed in information that the psychologist could look at. And it was AIDS, HIV that myself and my colleague, John Troyer at the Center for Death and Society used as our case study. But one of the problems we see, which is very common in disaster ma management is what I would call a failure of imagination. So they thought that we were saying COVID-19 was like AIDS. So they would come back with biological reasons as to why the two were different. You know, we get, we get sort of um, epidemiological critique and we'd say, no, no, that's not what we're saying. We're not talking about the, 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 the specific biological factors of the disease. We're talking to you about three years down the line and the fear of contamination. And so, you know, one of the places that I found very comforting early on was that a lot of the very good uh, exciting uh, criminologists uh, were writing about um, this has huge parallels to how we've always framed the working class or uh, spaces so you know the, th the thing to stay shut longest was the nightclubs you know we frame certain spaces as vectors of disease has always been linked very much to our perception of of who's good and bad in society and so we were feeding all of this in, but, you know, it's sort of, I think, you know, in those early, in those early days, as I say in the book throughout, you're just fogged with adrenaline and there's this, mm. this lady trying to give you case studies from two other types of disease. But yeah, it, what, what I had, what I have a lot of hope for is I think with the right support, it's fixable, but it's, it's a, it's a while yet. And lantern bearers, we'll need to be very aware of, of it as a challenge. I think that's really a, a very suitable challenge on which to draw the conversation to a close because what you've really reminded us about very forcefully there is what's been a theme in the whole of our conversation and that is learning. How do we actually learn? Learning isn't repetition. Learning is attending, absorbing and imagining in the light of what we've, we've attended to and what we've absorbed. And, and it's not, it's not easily done, it, it, it takes the time it takes. But you've given us every reason to think that there's, there's hope here and your own example and your own writing have really nurtured that. So thank you, it's been absolutely wonderful having this conversation. I'm really deeply grateful. But time is, is running short. It's been great that you've taken the time to join us, Pleasure. shared so much of the insight that you've crystallized in the book. And um, I hope that for those of you watching, this conversation has been just a bit of a window into all the riches that there are in Lucy's book, When the Dust Settles. All sorts of things there to surprise and inspire, to unsettle you creatively and positively, I hope, to enlarge the world that you inhabit in the way that Lucy's own world has been enlarged by the experiences that she describes there. So please read the book. You can find details of how and where to get a copy of the book in the chat here and on the RSA website. So all that's left for me to say is once again, Lucy, thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you so much for being the person you are. And thank you so much for sharing yourself, your work and your thoughts with us this afternoon. And thank you to everybody for joining us online and watching.